All right, so here we are again. Uh, we are in uh, the next section here uh, in our new series, Science in the Bible, lecture format. Um, are there any weaknesses with the scientific method? So we looked at the scientific method in the previous section, and uh, we uh, were able to see that you have an observation, that you ask a question about the observation, basically uh, a good um, educated guess. That then becomes your hypothesis using the words if and then. You then construct a test, an experiment, and you have an, uh, an experimental group and a control group. You have a conclusion, an interpretation, and that feeds back into your observations again, and the process continues. That's the scientific method. But uh, it turns out there are weaknesses with the scientific method. Um, so the scientific method, it works really well for observations that are measurable and repeatable. So for example, uh, gravity on Earth, hydrodynamics life cycle of a bee. Uh, of course, gravity on Earth. I can pick up a rock and I can drop it, and that, uh, that phenomenon is going to occur as many times as I want it to, because I'm looking at gravity on Earth. Hydrodynamics is simply the way that forces act on water, uh, and I can do that as well. The life cycle of a bee. I can go out and I can find bees and I can have a look at their life cycle, and so I can conduct uh, good experiments and do good science on these things because uh, these observations, the things that I'm observing, are measurable. They're repeatable. And when I've conducted uh, uh, an, an experiment using, typically with these examples, I can use an experimental and a con control group, the conclusions are highly persuasive. So for example, in the previous lecture, we looked at what the scientific method is, and we, we used uh, two plants. One was the control group that did not get the uh, water, and the other was the experimental group that did get the water. And of course, I showed quite clearly that plants need water to survive, and that was highly persuasive. If I was to conduct that experiment uh, and show someone these things who didn't know these things, they would be persuaded heavily persuaded by that particular uh, example. So what about uh, unobservable, untestable phenomena? Uh, and I'm not talking, but when I use the word untestable, I don't mean it's completely untestable. I'm talking about experiments that we do in the lab, uh, lab top experiments. Uh, I'm talking about, for example, gravity in another galaxy. I'm talking about chemistry within the Earth's core or the extinction of the dinosaurs. So yeah, I can conduct an experiment with gravity here on Earth uh, because it's right here, it's available to me. But I can't get to another galaxy. I can't go there to conduct experiments on gravity in another galaxy. What do I do in that situation? Uh, what about chemistry within the Earth's core? Uh, I can't get there. In fact, the furthest that we've dr drilled down is, is uh, well, I forget the exact depth, but we haven't drilled through the core, through the crust, uh, haven't gotten into the mantle, let alone the core. So how do I, uh, how do I determine what the chemistry is doing in the Earth's core when I can't get there? What about extinction of the dinosaurs? Of course, it's ap I absolutely cannot get there because that happened in the past. So I can't get there to actually observe these things. I can't get there to do repeatable experiments. Extinction of the dinosaur, happen, dinosaurs happened in the past. Um, and the main problem with um, the scientific method at this point is with the experiment or the test. I can't get there to, to uh, uh, do repeatable um, uh, tests or experiments. Um, and that's a bit of a problem. It turns out that I have to use circumstantial evidence instead. Uh, and this is a conclusion which uh, most scientists know about. When it comes to these kinds of uh, phenomena that are uh, sort of untestable in the sense that they're not, you can't measure or do repeated measurements and tests on these things, they know that there are issues here. Uh, so this quote here is from uh, the Geologic Society of America. It's the biggest a geology society in the world, and this is what they say about 
uh, my particular discipline, which is geology. They say using the scientific method can sometimes be complicated for geologists. Controlled experiments, usually carried out in uh, laboratories, are carefully designed to test a specific hypothesis, and they can be repeated. Unfortunately, many hypotheses in geology cannot be directly tested in a controlled experiment. Example, the origin of the Grand Canyon cannot be discovered by using this approach. Geologists must collect data by mapping or collecting specimens, and they must rely on circumstantial evidence, which is subject to interpretation, and therefore it can be challenged. So this is really interesting. Um, when you're looking at uh, some of these examples here, gravity in another galaxy, chemistry in those core extinction of the dinosaurs, you have to rely on circumstantial evidence. What we have to do with our flowchart, with our scientific method in this case, is we have to replace the, uh, and, and when I have experiment or test, I mean repeated, uh, a repeatable experiment or test, we have to replace that with a test or an experiment that uses circumstantial evidence. And whenever you are using circumstantial evidence, um, it's very different to when you can do uh, controlled experiments because the conclusions are different. The, the, the level of persuasion is different. In the first case, when we use controlled experiments, the level of persuasion is high. They're highly persuasive conclusions. But in this case, um, there are various levels of persuasion. Some people will be highly persuaded by your circumstantial evidence. However, others won't be. And so there's definitely a difference uh, with both of these kinds of science. When doing science on things that are here and now that we can, where we can repeat things in a lab as opposed to things that we can't get to or things that happened in the past. And that's just a reality that we need to deal with. So what is circumstantial evidence? Well, circumstantial evidence, basically, it's an inference that's based on the circumstances and then you have to apply logic. So it's very different than doing a controlled sort of an experiment. So for example, uh, circumstantial evidence is what is used in courts of law. It's what is used in crime scenes. Uh, when the police officer uh, arrives at the scene, he sees, uh, for example, a dead body, a gun. There are some fingerprints that are on the gun. Uh, maybe there's a bit of fluff over here on the ground. Uh, there's some blood that's over here. All of these objects uh, are situated at different positions in a house, for example, and all of those things have to be taken into consideration. They're all uh, circumstances. And so the investigator measures the distance from the gun to the, to the body, to the bit of fluff, and they go back to a lab and they investigate further uh, the fingerprints on the gun, the kind of blood uh, that's there, whose blood it is, how long it was being there. All of these things are circumstances. And uh, from that, the investigator um, builds an inference based on logic. And so they're applying their reason and their logic, and they're coming up with an inference. And it's based on all of these circumstances. Then what they have to do is they have to apply that to, uh, for example, in a court of law, in order to convince people that their interpretation of that circumstantial evidence is actually correct. And of course, it's very important in the court of law because it sends people to jail. Well, uh, geologists who are looking at aspects of historical geology or things that happened in the past have to act in much the same way. Uh, what they're looking at is fossils, so they're looking at bones, they're looking at sediments, they're looking at the geochemistry of the sediments, they're looking at the spatial relationship, and they have to make inferences based on the circumstances. And the conclusions are gonna be uh, different. The, 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 there's gonna be various levels of persuasion. And so we really need to keep that in mind when we're talking about historical geology. Uh, really, the, anything, uh, any of the historical sciences where things have occurred in the past. Okay, 
So uh, let's now look at uh, the difference between a hypothesis versus a theory versus a law. And this is a really confusing aspect of uh, what science is. Uh, you've probably had someone uh, say to you, for example, uh, you know, that's just a theory. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Or they're not sure what uh, the difference is between a law and a theory, or even between a hypothesis, a theory, and a law. And a lot of the time, the confusion actually results from the scientific community because actually different people have slightly different ways of viewing, for example, theories and laws. Hypothesis is straightforward. We've looked at what a hypothesis is. It's basically an educated guess. It's a way of uh, testing something using an educated guess. Simple. But a theory and a law, uh, depending on who you talk to, these can have slightly different meanings. So I've kind of uh, done a little bit of research, and, and, and so this is the definition that I've landed on, and that is that a scientific law, it provides a description of the observations. It tells us sort of what happens. Um, a theory explains why behind the observations. Uh, so a scientific theory or law is based on numerous observations and experiments. And this is, this is, this is very important, as we'll get to shortly. Okay, so an example of a, uh, of a law would be Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Uh, these tell you what the planets do as they orbit the sun. So Kepler, uh, he took a whole bunch of very, very careful uh, observations wrote them down, and he was able to tell us exactly what the planets are doing. And those laws, uh, there are three of them, are still in use today. But Kepler didn't really know why uh, that happened. In fact, uh, Kepler had a theory, and it had to do with harmonics. And of course, that's been proven false. But uh, he didn't really know why, but he knew exactly what they did. And so he could tell us, well, that's a law. And laws are a lot more uh, sure than theories. So when it comes to laws and theories, a law would definitely be something that is almost certain. Uh, that's not exactly true with theories, uh, as I'll talk about here shortly. Um, a theory is how things happen. And so an example of that would be evolution by natural selection. It's a theory uh, which Charles Darwin formulated in 1859. And it seeks to explain how living organisms change. Okay, so now that we know what a, a law is and what a theory is, I want to bring up one last uh, thing, and that is uh, sometimes, especially in creationism, you'll hear someone say about evolution, well, that's just a theory. And we really need to talk about that. Laws and theories, they're both based on numerous hypotheses, numer numerous experiments, and uh, conclusions have gone into laws and theories uh, in order for them to be established. And so we've got to be very careful when we say something like that's just a theory. Now, it turns out that you could say that in certain situations. Uh, and that's because I, for example, could have a theory. Uh, and the theory might be, for example, that there are little green men living on the moon. Now, that might be my theory. I might believe that. But there are no, uh, no scientifically conducted experiments to prove that my theory is right. And so, rightly so, someone could say to me, well, that's just a theory. And that's because there's, there's sort of no uh, scientifically established conclusions backing up my theory. However, uh, the theory of natural uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection is different. And so what you're looking at here is sort of um, you're looking at a spectrum. Uh, on the left hand side, at the bottom of the line, the word zero means there are no hypotheses. Uh, there are no scientifically established conclusions supporting that particular theory, whilst to the right, you have a maximum number of scientific hypotheses. That have uh, that that have um, sci have scientifically established conclusions, and so you've got a whole spectrum, and so surely the, the one on the left about my theory about little green men living on Mars with zero of these uh, scientifically established conclusions, yes, someone could say to me that's just a theory. But what about the one on the right? What about the theory of evolution by natural selection? Well, it turns out 
And, and by the way, when I say the theory of evolution, the evolution I'm talking about here is change, adaptation. I'm not talking about uh, molecules to man evolution. I'm not talking about uh, that we all come from a common ancestor and the ultimate common ancestor being a single cell. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about adaptation. I'm talking about actual change in organisms due to natural selection. The scientific evidence supporting that is overwhelming. Uh, there have been many hypotheses uh, that have been conducted and uh, I would say that uh, there's a lot, therefore, of scientifically established conclusions justifying this particular theory. And so in this situation, you can't just say, well, it's just a theory because you're using the word theory to argue against someone. In this context, you can't just say that. And that's what I want for us to understand here. When you say to someone, that's just a theory, you first need to go back and have a look at the context. And in this context, you, you can't rightly say that's just a theory for the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, now, it turns out that a, 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 the theory of Darwinian evolution, um, uh, which would be a molecules to man theory based on natural selection. So a theory of macroevolution based on natural selection, that's a theory too. And it turns out that that particular theory um, does not have nowhere near as many uh, scientifically established conclusions as does uh, the theory of uh, what, what I would call microevolution by natural selection. And I'm reading a book by Stephen Jay Gould, uh, The uh, Structure of Evolutionary Theory, and even he says that. Uh, he says that macroevolution is not due to microevolution or it's not due to um, natural selection. Natural selection plays a big part in evolution, but it is not the, uh, the ultimate cause of macroevolution. And he goes on to say there's not a lot of evidence to support that particular theory. Of course, he has another theory, punctuated equilibrium, that he, he thinks does have scientific evidence to support it. So again, we've got to go back and we've got to have a look at the context of the theory that someone's proposing. Now, I've got some other ones here as well, conspiracy theories. Uh, so conspiracy theories are just a little bit more along the line on the spectrum because usually there is some odd scientific um, uh, experiment uh, that's been conducted. And uh, usually one or two of these scientifically established conclusions, uh, unfortunately, is enough to lead an entire population of people to begin accepting it and believing it. No, when it comes to conspiracy theories, you can say, hey, that's just a theory because there are a very few number uh, of scientifically established conclusions that actually back it up. Um, a little bit, again, along further along the line here is, and this is just an example, would be the link between vaccines and autism. Yeah, there have been uh, a lot of scientific uh, um, experiments done on this particular question and um, I'm not fully convinced one way or the other. I, at this point, I don't think there is a link between vaccines and autism. And please don't shoot me a message if you disagree with me. Okay, I could be wrong. I just think that ultimately there, is a, there are a many, many more scientifically established conclusions uh, that have been drawn that actually reject that particular hypothesis. That's my position at the moment. And so just be careful when it comes to someone giving you a theory on something, just be careful about how you reply. So when someone's talking about the theory of evolution by natural selection, you can't just say, that's just a theory. Okay, so that is it for this part. Uh, the next time we come back, uh, I wanna look at how science, um, how science and uh, religion uh, and even some aspects of philosophy should be uh, coordinated uh, from a Christian perspective. Okay, so that wraps us up. Uh, don't forget to please subscribe, uh, ring the bell, and uh, hit the like button as well, uh, as that helps out a lot. And we'll see you in the next one. Okay, thanks very much. Goodbye.